上当百年，欺世大官。Hello, everyone. It's Michael here. In over 100 episodes of our program so far, we have discussed many examples of Chinese fellow countrymen who lost their lives for the Chinese Communist Party. Among the 100 or more so-called heroes of the CCP, there were also several foreigners. In this episode, we will talk about another American, Edgar Snow, a well-known figure in China and so-called role model by the CCP. He had covered up for the CCP for decades. And in turn was hyped by the CCP and referred to as an old friend of Mao and the Chinese people. Before we continue, please support and subscribe our channel by clicking the small bell and share. So, what had he done to become a hero of the CCP? In 1936, the CCP was driven to the cave dwellings in northern Shaanxi by Chiang and the National Army. At first, Mao was busy playing dirty tricks within the CCP. Crushed the local CCP leaders Liu Zhidan and Xi Zhongxun, took over their armed force, and stabilized his control of power. How had Mao evolved from robber to bandit? Mao was enlightened upon the arrival of a group of visitors. This group of visitors were Mao's countrymen from abroad. One of them was Bai Chuen, Henry Norman Bethune, a Canadian doctor who had been appraised by the CCP for decades. Others included well-known left-wing reporters Agnes Smedley, Edgar Snow, and Louis Avery. The group were treated as first-class VIP by the CCP. They had a panoramic view of Yan'an, the newly established CCP-controlled region, enjoyed good food and drink, and befriended the CCP high-rank leadership, especially with Mao. As a result of extensive brainwashing, they voluntarily joined the CCP propaganda. And covered up for Mao and communism. The most representative and helpful of them is American journalist Edgar Snow. Every day he sat down in cave dwellings for interviews, mainly to chat with Mao Zedong, Zhu De, Zhou Enlai, and many CC cadres, and to ask questions, take pictures, and present various performances staged by the CCP. He then wrote the book Red Star Over China. Which introduced the CCP to the Western world through his red rosy viewpoint. He whitewashed the revolution and glorified the process where Mao and the CCP rose to power. By today's standards, the book would be a literary script, as Snow didn't write about factual events such as the brutal communist infighting, the Yan'an rectification, the killing and destruction of corpses in small dark rooms, and he certainly wouldn't have been allowed to see or take photos. What Snow wrote in his book were scenes and events he was allowed to see and participate in, arranged intentionally or even deliberately. Some scenarios were posed for him. Mao and the CCP leadership knew very well what the role of a left-wing Westerner could play for them. The pen of a leftist journalist was worth a thousand armies, tanks, and cannons. Later, the U.S. withdrew its support to Jiang's National Army. Which connived with the CCP to take over power in mainland China through Snow's contributions. The additional effect of Snow's paint floor scrubbing made the CCP overjoyed. Back then, Mao and the CCP were not well known in the West. After the book's publication, not only did Mao and the CCP receive much foreign aid, but many young intellectuals in the country aspired to join the CCP in Yan'an in a steady stream. It is no exaggeration to say that many of these hot-blooded young people were excited by the descriptions in the book, and came to Yan'an with their childish ideology of changing China for the better, and were brainwashed to die for the cause. Many of them died in the revolution. If the CCP were to praise and promote themselves, the number of people fooled would be significantly lower. However. The propaganda was much more effective when it came from a foreigner, an outsider with blonde hair, blue-eyed, white-skinned, left-hearted figure. The CCP would say, "How about that? Now foreigners are helping us and are sharing stories of Yan'an." This is a large bowl of sweet soup that the CCP is still drinking from. They just could not throw it away, even if it's rancid. It's just a cheap sale. 
If you don't believe me, you can count how many foreigners there are on YouTube nowadays who promote the interests of the CCP, telling the so-called Chinese stories vigorously. By doing so, they earn double payment, one secretly paid by the CCP and the other driven up click data by the CCP web army as to fool the YouTube mechanism which pays for data traffic. There is a black hand behind all of this. It could be said that the Snows are their ancestors. Having had a taste of such strategy, beginning from the time of Yan An, the CCP began to pay full attention to the war of public relations with the Western media, journalists, writers and scholars. Edgar Snow was born in 1905 in Kansas City, Missouri, and went on to study at the University of the Missouri School of Journalism. In September 1928, he went to China to work as a Chinese correspondent for an American newspaper. In 1931, he met Helen Foster, a beautiful 24-year-old girl who had just arrived in China with a golf backpack and a tennis racket, intending to work in the US. Become consulate general in Shanghai for a year, and then travel the world to fulfill her dream of becoming a great writer. When she met Edgar Snow, the course of her life changed. Helen and Edgar got married the following year. From 1934 to 1937, Snow was also a lecturer in the Department of Journalism at Young Jing University, and during this period he was also a special correspondent for the New York Sun and the British Daily Herald. Mainland viewers will question, as a young American, why was he uprooted from his hometown and chose to stay in China for a long time? Is life in America worse than in China? Is he an undercover agent for the Western anti-China forces? Now everyone knows that journalist status is a natural cover for being a secret agent. The CIA was established in 1947, and the ruling government and the US Empire were comrades in arms. They entered into the State House ten years earlier, and there was no need to make trouble, but the CCP planted many mines around Jiang in 1936. At key moments, the mines would explode one after the other. Thomas Bernard, the author of Snow's personal biography, argues, factors related to economics did play a large role in Snow's staying in China. That is, he and his wife could live comfortably, even luxuriously, in China on a small and irregular income. Snow's first wife, Helen, also acknowledged that economical factors were important to their choice to stay in China. As Helen put it, if we had stayed in Shanghai, our standard of living would have been many times higher. We joined the 3,080 Americans in Shanghai from around the world who were living like a prince, while the world was being crucified on a cross of gold, meaning that the world was in a bad economic shape, and they had come to China at the right time. Apparently, working as a journalist in China not only provided a comfortable life, but also brought a lot of money to the reporter, Snow, who received 250000 from the Saturday Evening Post alone in the 10 years from 1940 to 1950, which was not a small amount at that time. During his time in China, Snow saw the hardships of common people and thus developed a negative view of the national government. As the saying goes, meeting the right people in the right place at the right time will change a person. At this time, Snow began to change after being in contact with two people, Song Qingling and Lu Xun. Snow quickly became a little pink and left-leaning. By that time, Song Qingling had already been a secret member of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which our program had exposed long ago. Interested readers can refer to our previous episodes. Lu Xun was a well-known writer who was considered a friend of the Communists. Snow believed that the personal relationship with Song Qingling, the widow of the founding father Sun Yat-sen, was even more important than reporting on the first shot of World War II. Naturally, he accepted Mrs. Song's many views on the Kuomintang and Chiang Kai-shek, believing that she was a member of the Kuomintang. Even if Song Qingling regarded Chiang Kai-shek as a national calamity, she said that the CCP was the only revolutionary force in China that has inherited Sun Yat-sen's unfinished revolutionary cause and will eventually unify China. He was also convinced by such slogans. Maybe he thinks this woman is really opinionated and good for China. If Snow had known then that his trusted Song Qingling was a secret member of the Communist Party, 
I wonder if he would have hit his head against the wall. Of course, history has no ifs. That's all for this episode. Please join us next time for part two, where we will introduce how the Red Star over China story came to be.